Welcome, new viewers, to episode 39 of Illusions Exist. Now, my new viewers won't be familiar with some of the things that I am not going to say. Um, so I'm just going to I'm just going to dive in. But before I do, I want to disclose. I've been asked in the past and refused, but. Um, I want to disclose, you know, I've had uh, three glasses of, of wine, and this is this is uh, episode thirty nine. But I've I have had three glasses of wine. Now this is a good thing for this particular video. Whether you think it's a good thing overall, I'm I'm sure you will share with me in comments. But it's a good thing overall because of the subject that I'm going to talk about, which you've seen in the title of the video already. So you kind of probably already know what I'm getting at. Now, I've had many emotional, psychological reactions or phenomena uh, plague me for the last eight years. I'm not saying they didn't plague me before that, different ones, but in the, in the, for, specifically, rather than for example. Um, depression. You know, I think it's common knowledge now among the kind of people that end up watching my videos, so I'm including you, new viewers, probably you know that a, a big symptom of depression is not, oh, I feel sad. You don't feel that way. You might look sad or lethargic, but it's really the not feeling like doing anything. And it's not a lethargy that's from a lack of physical energy. It's a psychic, a psychological energy where depression makes you just feel like not doing anything. That's the psychological perspective. And the psychological perspective, remember, is as a third person uh, observation, right? So I'm, I'm the, the first person, you know, I, and I'm looking at psychology, how they act, right? Or how he or she acts. But, um, again, new viewers, old viewers probably long ago memorized this. But new viewers might not realize one of the definitions of philosophy that I like is psychology from the inside. So it's psychology, and but psychology is trying to be a scientific t with empirical observations of that third person, he and they and her. Whereas philosophy is psychology from the inside, where you break the basic premise of science by you're the observer and the subject, both. I see me. So I see me is a totally valid domain of inquiry. But... Um, there's an inherent, like, I don't know, bias or cycle or recursion that, that makes it fundamentally more complex than science, which is obviously already complex enough. Okay. Now, um, from the, so I'm going to describe what I think depression is from the inside. Now, since 2012, in the last eight years specifically, I have faced these, you know, new to me sorts of psychological experiences. Um, the primary one being a kind of PTSD. Um, and I felt I had these PTSD symptoms and they lasted for quite a long time, including till today. Um, and resurging, so it's not totally steady, but especially, you know, the first couple years and uh, until I moved to Maine and then a couple years after that. But um, 
So most of the time I'm talking about, well, no, what is that? Half the time, <coughs> excuse me, since 2012. And, um, but, you know, I, I knew I wasn't necessarily diagnosable. I've looked into these kinds of things when you have psychological tendencies. You know, psychology is in a weird state. They don't want to diagnose you as being, having a psychological ailment of any sort. There is no sort of psychological equivalent of, oh, I just have the sniffles. They don't diagnose you until you fuck your life up. Even if you were having delusions or uh, meaning, you know, like hallucinatory delusions, if you happen to just have them in the morning, uh, but you got yourself together in time for work, you go to work, never any problem. You don't lose your job or your marriage or anything that's a like a life fuck up that you could point to, then you're not really diagnosable. Um it's weird. It's like if in me it's it's analogous to if in medical science having a tumor, a malignant tumor, wouldn't be counted as cancer until it gave you so much pain you had to go to the hospital until it started spreading so fast that you were going to die. It wouldn't really count as an ailment. I think this is partially because of the stigma Right, and there used to be a stigma for having a physical ailment, and you can easily meet people and, and baby boomers still that are like, oh, I never get sick. You know, being physically sick to them is an embarrassment. And psychological illnesses people take as an Now, I, as an embarrassment, I think that, you know, we're in an era where psychologically it's like back in the time when everybody had you know, had head lice, unless you shaved your hair off. We have psychological ailments in that way. We're in the, we're like in the age of leeches as far as psychological. We only know that there is such a thing as psychological illness, and we're really bad at solving it. I, no criticism intended to the people that try to help addicts and psychologists trying to help people with their emotional problems, including people that are not particularly diagnosable with a disorder, you know, all praise to you. Um, it's just that we don't have the kind of scientific consensus we have about something like, I don't know, even dealing with a, a, a cold or a flu or but you know certainly nowhere near our you know our focus at dealing with something like a broken leg or a sports injury you know um so anyway okay the subject so i think i've had a lot of things and the first one was was a sort of a ptsd and i had a, i hired a consultant to do a business analysis for me because I left being an employee and I came to Maine to start a business. So there's this kind of a consultant that evaluates you in this sort of non-judgmental way. Like, are you detail-oriented and you want to do everything exactly right? Do you like things done just good enough and you're fast? Do you, you know, and it, it finds out what kind of a worker and person you are for your business this guy consults on uh, people that are looking to get like CEO or CFO or CEO type jobs, but he'll do this uh, in general. And it just tells you like how to, what kind of a person are you? Market yourself this way and you'll find the people that are looking for that kind of a person to fill whatever role. In my case, I was starting my own business, but I talked to him about the PTSD thing and he told me about a psychologist um, local to me in Maine, and I went to this guy. Was he was really a great guy? I went to this guy. I think two times, uh, maybe once, but I, I I think it was twice. And he said kind of what I expected, um, in that yeah, I did have these PTSD type symptoms, but you know it wasn't diagnosable. And here's the kind of approach to take and here's some resources to read up since you know I'm a, I'm trying to be aware and conscious of these symptoms before they become dysfunctional 
here's some resources so you can know even more about how this kind of tendency works. You know, because I believe all of the personality disorders are also personality tendencies. And when you have the tendency, the way it is now is they're not going to, you know, give you the scarlet letter of a disorder diagnosis or anything like that. But it, if you want to deal with your own emotions, it helps to understand what they have learned. But you have to take it with a grain of salt, of course, because, you know, the DSM changes a lot, even though the disorder, the personality disorder spectrum has gotten very interesting and somewhat stable. Okay, I'm not here to talk about that. What I noticed as a theme while I was thinking of this PTSD kind of thing, which is a bunch of stuff, I mean, uh, difficulty with memories about traumatic experience that, that might have caused it, um, well, basically, I'll, I'll finish up by saying this, because this was a sort of insightful, and this guy conveyed it to me, and it jived with other things that I had known about PTSD that led me to think that maybe I had these kind of symptoms, um, you know, eight years ago for, for a couple of years, um, you know, gradually, I think, tapering off, um, though not entirely gone or anything, but... Um, but again, since none of these things are leading to a dysfunction in taking care of my regular life or enjoyment, you know, it's it's all sort of moot. It's just kind of me as an individual. It's important to me. Um, <clears throat> anyway, PTSD is sort of a phenomenon where you end up storing in your short-term memory and keeping in your short-term memory things that should migrate to long-term memory. So... Like, for the case of someone that is diagnosable with PTSD, like from somebody that's had to spend six years in a war zone, um, they, their sense of immediate danger that they get becomes, like, stuck in their short-term memory, in their short-term emotional mood, and it can never migrate. Ironically... It's in the short-term memory, and you can't remember as many things about it as people that that process it don't don't end up with the PTSD. You know, their metabolism is able to pass it, and of course, people with PTSD have done this a lot. They passed a lot of things, but some of them end up sticking, and it locks in your short-term memory. So, ironically you actually remember less detail. Why? Well, think about it. When you're in immediate danger, something's in immediate danger as if you have a danger in your short-term memory, you don't think of a lot of the details because you're in a, you know, fight or flight kind of mode. You know, you don't have a lot of time to think over a lot of details other than what you've collected in order to inform your ability to fight or fly. Therefore, you end up having like less detailed memories about certain things and you panic in in uh, crowded situations or like a concert or something like that or even just shopping and going out where people gather. Um, and that is what I've been thinking about, you know, in terms of what do I have to deal with psychologically in order to balance me out again eventually. Now I'm here eight years later, and it's like eight years, and then seven years in, I was like, geez, it does feel like I'm never going to get over some of these things. I don't have to. I give myself permission to never, and then it was seven years, and I was like, what? It's kind of a, you know, I need to process stuff. And then, and recently, I started to realize that it's a depression. There's a depression that is the, you know, the, the baseline here. And this video is to share my idea of what depression is like from a philosophical point of view, meaning psychology from the inside. Me looking at psychology as the psychological phenomena, interestingly enough, with the film strip, the only psychological phenomena that I have quite so much information about. 
And what depression is, I think, is, um, and yes, this is a simplification on purpose to try to get, you know, a, a, a grip on it. Um, it's when you don't want to do things you know you will enjoy. Like, there's things I know I will enjoy, and there's so many things now that I did my whole life, no matter what, no matter how rich or poor or anything else that I would do that I could list for you, taking walks miles into the woods, finding places where there were miles worth of woods to walk off into, or living in places like that and exploring, and even in the city, finding the little nooks and crannies where, you know, between on a, where there's a little cliff and the houses have a, a space between them, you know, a, and you can hang out where the sun comes through the leaves, even though you're in the city and there's a few birds around. And looking at leaves, looking, finding ant trails, uh, taking walks just even on the, the road, dirt roads, dro taking drives and, and exploring uh, roads that you, it's like, oh, you ever notice that road? And you drive in it. Um, and I know these things are enjoyable. And depression, I think, is when you know it's going to be enjoyable, but, you know, why bother? And um, work plays a funny role in this because if you enjoy your work, I enjoy my work. If, in general, I, you know, had some, like, uh, a giant trust fund or won the lottery... I would still program. What I would do would change, you know. Uh, I would do more and more creative stuff. Um, but I enjoy all programming, including also, you know, the practical stuff. And um, however, in the last eight years, I wouldn't have been working. So I've been like a workaholic. And I wouldn't have been so workaholic about it um, if I hadn't had to make a living. The fact that I like to do it wouldn't have been enough motivation. And, you know, it's kind of like some people say where because the, there's a point, and I think this is the, the depression, um, where, yeah, you know it would be fun to go down to the swimming hole and jump in the swimming hole like you always enjoyed. And you know you still enjoy it, but now you're depressed. But what's the point of enjoyment, really? It's meaningless. Now, people will tell you, and it's true, it's a good advice to, you know, try. You know, you got to check it out, push it. But to try to just go do those things. Stop asking yourself, but do you want to do it? It's like, look, you know it would be fun to go, you know, jump in the river. So just drive five minutes, go to the river, jump in. Even if you come right back, you know, just try. You'll like it, you know. The problem is when you're depressed also, when you force yourself to do those things, you go into them with such a cynical attitude, it is excruciating, right? Like, let's say, I don't like crowds too much, but I would like going to concerts. I've always liked that, you know, and in Enjoy that and it's worth it and then you can even get like hey I can even enjoy the crowd like people that enjoy crowds I can get a little sense of that because I have these other motivations to go and then you realize ah oh, it's such a bother all of those emotional whether it's fun or not and you just <coughs> you, you if you force yourself <coughs> excuse me I'm not going to edit it um, because authenticity. <coughs> so anyway, if you do force yourself to do the things, you'll find them excruciating and then make you more depressed. So I find, you know, you have to take baby steps. And right now I'm working on some baby steps, realizing that you know, the baby steps I've taken so far is that I bought a house in the woods that's on a pond. And so even if I just stumble out of my house and go, I'm sad, sad, don't want to enjoy myself. I'm out in nature. 
one of those things I automatically enjoy. And so I'm able to slowly soak it in. And it's making me realize that, you know what? I want to take a walk every day. I want to, you know, there's things I still do. Like, you yeah, have, I love dogs and cats and pets and stuff. And, you know, if you if we got a puppy a couple of years ago, you got to play fetch and go, you know. And so, like work, where I'm doing it to make a living, but I enjoy it, it's one of the ways you can pull in enjoyment because things you have to do for reasons other than enjoyment. Like, you can't be an asshole and not give your cat and dog love and attention and stuff. But I want to move back beyond that. And um, and yet you can't force yourself. You have to find the baby steps of like, yeah, that would be fun to go buy some, you know, gardening stones and make some trails in my yard in the woods. Or I'm going to buy one plant and plant it. Or one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go around all of my acre and I'm going to learn every plant. I'm going to look at every plant and learn it as an individual. Because I was thinking, I want to buy some plants and start not landscaping. It's very woodsy, and that's what's best for the for the lake because, it, you know, it controls the phosphorus in the soil that can run off. Like, lawns aren't good and stuff. So you want it to be wild, but it doesn't mean you can't manicure, manicure and choose which, you know, plants go where. So think this will be fun this is one of the baby steps go out and make plants and I realized no the baby step before that is learn all the plants that were already planted by the people that owned the house before and that are wild hundred year old pines you know and go meet all of those now why do that well because I know this is the thing that I enjoy you know I enjoy looking at leaves leaves are I know they're called leaves but leaves are my friend and they are um, like I know there's I uh, obviously I agree there's really beautiful flowers but in there's also flowers that really aren't that great as far as the overall beauty whereas all leaves are pretty pretty awesome and now it's it's the rare leaf maybe fern or something that is as pretty as a gorgeous flower um, but there's a lot more leaves. So if you go out and just hang out, sit somewhere in nature, um, checking out all the leaves that you can see within, you know, your local area, um, that always gives me a good feeling. So these are just ways to step out and do that because I really think the depression comes in the form of, I know good and well, Jumping in the water will make me feel better. But in the last three summers where I've lived on this pond, there have been times where I felt like I should go jump in the water. And, it, you know, in the past, in my life, I would definitely jump in the water and spend some time. If I only had 15 minutes, I'd go do it for 15 minutes. You know, I wouldn't go, oh, I only have 15 minutes, to bother. And then dealing with sort of my feelings, my feels, um, you know, I might skip it. And then later I'm like, oh, why would I skip that? It's not an infinite number of chances to do something you know you're going to enjoy, especially if it's only going to take five or three minutes. So um, I don't know if overall I'm doing any better, but for example, thinking about this stuff this summer for, you know, the last week since it's um, um, it's still chilly, but it's been hot outside, and it's refreshing. You know, it's like, I want to just go in every day. Why? It's a baby step into it. I, I know. It doesn't matter if my brain feels like, yeah, why well, bother doing something I enjoy? Um, that's that spoil Because I've also been feeling guilty about being spoiled. Because even though this isn't everybody's cup of tea, living in the woods, down a snowy road that's hard to get down and kind of costs a lot to, with my neighbor to, you know, keep accessible and stuff um it's my cup of tea i love i that's all i ever wanted was to work from home in a home office in a paradise kind of you know my style of paradise meaning you know nature we got foxes we got all 
minks and we got animals and beautiful clouds and it's that's what I like. And then you feel I feel guilty. It's like and but you're not gonna go enjoy it as much as you can. You know, and then the guilt is and it's the whole depression of guilt all mixing up and stuff. And you can't force yourself to go do those things just because the your intellectual brain realizes no that you that you enjoy this and it's good for you. You c- I almost have to trick myself out of that shell and moving to Maine in the woods and, and buying this home was a way to be like, well, I'm going to just set myself in the middle of it. And sometimes I'll spill outside and I'll get that vibe that I intellectually know is good for me, whether I'm willing to admit I want to enjoy myself or not. And I think it's, it, I think it's slowly working. Um, And uh, that's my message for this video. I think I'm going to make another video. I was thinking of adding it on to the end of this, but this looks like it's it's been a while. How long did I make this? this is a half an hour probably? Yep. All right. So that's my video. And that's my message. And I hope it can help you. If you deal ever with depression, you got to let yourself feel how you need to feel, you know? And that includes depressed. And that Im- includes... Hey, screw those things I enjoy. But at some point, you want to take some baby steps, you know, and let yourself um, and set yourself in situations that you know uh, from your past experience uh, are things that sort of, uh, you know, empower and uh, not so much empower. The things that release stress we don't you don't need to try to get some super high powerful or high attain a high you know level of ecstasy or self-confidence or anything what we really need i think my opinion all of us but it's my opinion that all of us but it's just my opinion what you really want is a release of stress, right? You don't want to be stressed. I mean, it'd be great to be a billionaire. It'd be great to be famous and everybody hangs on your every word, uh, hypothetically. But not if it would be stressful. And we know both of those things are pretty stressful. Especially the, the second thing about being famous and people hanging on your every word. That's stressful. So while there's certainly something people like about getting accolades and attention, we also know it's stressful. And so in a practical way, really what we what we need to do when we're stepping out of depression is not pump ourselves up with a positive attitude about how we will become famous. We're depressed because we're not famous or whatever it would be for you guys. Um, you just... Let yourself do the things that you know relieve stress. And it could be Sudoku, which I find stressful, so I'm using a counterexample. Some people could relax that way. Um, another thing for me is reading a novel, and I've been doing that a lot um, in the eight years, but especially like the last four years where I realized I just need, I can't just read nonfiction either. I gotta have a book. And if I have a book, I'm not feeling like, I'm feeling grumpy, let's say, it, not in terms of what I'm not feeling, but I am feeling grumpy, or I'm feeling like, eh. I can get a book, even a mediocre one, but if I, I'm, I of course, try to get excellent ones, and if I get a, a decent book, um, oh, it's great when it's an excellent book, but, um, you know, and I'm all upset or something, I could take a break and read for a couple hours, and my frame of mind, it's like the difference between having a dirty face and splashing water on your face and having a clean one after. So, this is, uh, you know, maybe I should call these episodes like this the Heithla Day episodes, where, because Heithla Day was like, you know, you can't just want to share information. I'm like, hey, no pressure on anybody. I just want to share information. And he was like, no. You also have to have the mission of trying to help a brother out. 
So I would like to help my brothers and sisters out. And if part of that help could be you just expressing your disagreement, that would be fine. Do so in the comments. I'm interested. Um, because originally, you know, uh, I, this was a conversational medium. We're in a non-conversational mode right now where it's just output streams, but I'm still interested. So I read all the comments. Um, and if anybody does want to have a conversation, we can set up a Skype call or something and, um, and have one. I'm very open to that. But i um, not going to work very hard for it because there's not a lot in it for me directly at the moment. But um, again, we're maintaining this communication channel for the long run for when it recovers and becomes healthy. Cheers.